This is a movement to end apartheid, which human rights During a challenging bipartisan Israeli status quo, or if you cancel, faster than anything. Emily Wilder was a young journalist at the Associated Press fired this week. To leave is right. That makes us complicit in an ongoing crime against humanity. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the news and examine the coverage. Here are the media stories we're looking at this week. Inflection point. Is there a breakthrough in the U.S. in the coverage of Palestine and Israel? Hijacked. Belarusian airspace is now a no-go zone for many airlines, after authorities there plucked a dissident out of the sky. Another European leader shows his authoritarian side. Slovenia's prime minister says he's at war with the media and making excuses for racists. Sometimes things don't go to plan. A generator that's built for the job. The ceasefire in Gaza has been in place for more than a week now, and the after effects of the bombings there are reverberating a long way from the Holy Land. Nowhere is that more evident than in the United States, where every year billions of dollars in military aid flows from Washington to Tel Aviv. For decades, that close bilateral relationship has skewed the news coverage in the U.S. of the Palestine-Israel conflict in favor of America's ally. That is clearly starting to shift. The question is, to what extent and will it last? This is a story about an illegal occupation, an apartheid system of government, and forces of change that are now tapping into American social justice movements like Black Lives Matter in order to get their messages out. U.S. media outlets are starting to reflect that in the way they cover the story, the people they interview, and the terminology they employ. Our starting point this week, the American mainstream media, and where the coverage of the Palestine-Israel story goes from here. What we're really telling Palestinians fighting apartheid that is the same thing being told to my fellow black Americans across our country. What Americans are seeing in the coverage of the Palestine-Israel story, finally, is a dominant news narrative under assault. We don't share the same rights as the Israeli Jews. They turn on U.S. news channels and hear terminology they've seldom heard attached to this conflict. The idea that it's even remotely controversial to call what Israel has imposed on Palestinians a form of apartheid is laughable. They see more Palestinian faces than the networks usually serve up, something approaching a balance. This is a movement against settler colonialism, which seeks to remove Palestinians and place Jewish Zionist settlers in their place. When they check out the New York Times, they see op-eds and images the paper had rarely found fit to print until now. The discourse is substantially different this time around. It remains deeply problematic, but nonetheless, it's a massive improvement over what it was like in previous massive Israeli assaults on Gaza. Everything changed on this uh, Israeli attack. Social media played a large role in shaping the American discourse. And as one Zionist organization said this week, Israel could uh, do nothing right on social media. Israel hit Gaza with air. It truly does feel different, and it, it feels like it has the potential to significantly change how the world views this ongoing Israeli-Palestinian crisis. Why now? Israel has sent settlers in before to expel Palestinians from their homes, as it's preparing to do in Sheikh Jarrah, East Jerusalem. It's waged war on Gaza five times since 2005, each time inflicting far more civilian casualties than it suffered, resulting in accusations of war crimes. Israel has targeted news outlets before, as it just did when it destroyed the offices of the Associated Press and Al Jazeera in Gaza. None of that is new. What has changed is the mobilizing effect that all the video coming out on this story has had on people thousands of miles from the Holy Land. And there are new communities on social media carrying that content. Informal networks built by Americans to demand social justice at home that have proven to be adaptable. Just as the progressive media have shaped the American response to the George Floyd murder and led the way toward a real reckoning in the American public opinion about our treatment uh, of people of color in the United States. 
The same effect happened on the mainstream media and public opinion, I believe, with respect to Palestinians this time. Social media has played a great role in educating people around the word, uh, world about Palestinians. When it comes to the United States, the media could not deny the videos that were coming out of Gaza of children crying over their parents or parents burying their children. Um, even the more sentimental videos of kids looking for their toys or finding a little goldfish that was still alive, it really spoke to the hearts of people around the world. On the coverage of this long-term conflict, terminology is yet another battleground. One word that American journalists have long had an aversion to when describing Israel's systemic treatment of Palestinians is a term that originated in South Africa and its history of racial oppression, apartheid. Fifteen years ago, when former President Jimmy Carter dared to use apartheid in a book title, he was deemed to have gone too far. The only American president to ever win a Nobel Peace Prize for their work in the Middle East, Carter was effectively blackballed, exiled by both the U.S. political and media establishments. It's only one word, but the fact that American journalists and commentators are now able to utter it to call Israel an apartheid state and news outlets are allowing that is significant. There are a number of liberals who use the word apartheid to describe Israel's treatment of the Palestinians. Accusing uh, Israel of apartheid. Apartheid is a word that has been used by Human Rights Watch, by Amnesty International. It's even been used by Beth Selim, which is the largest Israeli-led human rights organization within Israel. Apartheid is when you separate people based on ethnicity or based on nationality, where one group has more rights than the other just based on who they are. And that is fun fundamentally exactly what is happening in Palestine, Israel at this moment. And so usage of the word apartheid is not just something that is controversial, it's necessary. The fact that we're having this conversation, journalists in newsrooms are writing articles about the question of do you call it apartheid, do you call it ethnic cleansing, all that. I think that's enormously positive. And that shows a shift in people, not just merely being willing to, to rethink their assumptions, but being capable of rethinking their assumptions. People have to recognize what Gaza Strip is. It's one of the most menacing... The U.S. mainstream media are slowly moving in the right direction on this story. Sometimes, though, it's a case of two steps forward, one step back. Take the example of 22-year-old Emily Wilder, recently hired by the Associated Press to work in Arizona. Four days after the Israelis blew up the AP's offices in Gaza, Wilder was fired. Pro-Israel elements online had publicized some of Wilder's pro-Palestinian social media posts from her college days. The best defense for those who want to uh, defend Israel for bombing AP is to, in effect, accuse AP of being in bed with Hamas, and then you just start searching for dirt. And AP decided to throw a young journalist who, by the way, is Jewish, uh, just to throw her under the bus. It, it, it's, it's pretty breathtaking. The, the suggestion is that if you are an activist in support of Palestinian rights, it means you can't be a journalist um, who reports objectively. The truth at the end of the day is that everybody has biases. And all you can do is be honest about these biases so that we understand where the reporting is coming from, what shapes it. This idea that you must exclude anybody who has a history of advocating for Palestinian human rights, while people who have much more nefarious histories of being participants in an illegal occupation and a system of apartheid, that's a double standard that's just simply absurd on its face. Journalists like Canadian-born Matty Friedman, now based in Jerusalem. The AP employed him in Israel until 2014, after he had done a stint in the Israeli army. Last week, Friedman filed a story for another U.S. news outlet, The Atlantic, whose editor-in-chief, American Jeffrey Goldberg, moved to Israel in his 20s, volunteered for the army, and was a guard at a prison notorious for its treatment of Palestinians. Current New York Times political columnist David Brooks and former Jerusalem bureau chief Ethan Bronner, both of them American, have had sons in the Israeli army. And on the broadcast side, there's news anchor Wolf Blitzer. His bio on CNN's site is thick with detail 
on the stories he's covered, the interviews he's conducted, the honorary degrees he's received. Not one mention, though, of his former job at the biggest, most influential pro-Israel lobby group of them all, APAC. There's a strong Israel today, a vibrant Israel that is not going to disappear. Wolf Blitzer at CNN worked for APAC, helped destroy the two-state solution back in the 80s, a story I always want to tell. And, you know, this guy, uh, he's forgiven his resume. I think that Wolf Blitzer understands that his job is not to support APAC now. His job is to get a range of opinion in, and I sense that he feels a responsibility to do so. Ben Wiedemann is on the scene for us. He's now in Gaza. You're there. You're an eyewitness. To Just as Emily Wilder, a very young person who uh, had done good work in college, uh, I'm sure was going to be strenuously trying to do her job as an Associated Press reporter. But that double standard is obnoxious. We're not asking the media outlets to be pro-Palestine. I don't need Emily to be pro-Palestine. I don't need journalists to be pro-Palestine. I need you to be objective, to tell us what the facts are on the ground. And the facts are very clear. There is an occupation that is illegal and funded by the U.S. government. The apartheid is clear. The siege on Gaza is clear. And unfortunately, the double standard is because if the American people truly knew what was happening in Palestine, and knowing that it is funded by their taxpayer dollars, I think they would be a resurgence of a resistance that the government of the United States of America would not be able to ignore. A passenger plane was forced to land in Minsk, Belarus last weekend in what initially appeared to be a bomb scare, but turned out to be a ploy by the Lukashenko government to arrest a journalist, Roman Protasevich. Minakshi Ravi has been following this story. Mina, why did the Belarusian authorities go to such great lengths to get this guy? Protasevich is a 26-year-old who co-founded and edited a channel called Nexta on the messaging platform Telegram. That channel played a big role in documenting and organizing some of the protests that broke out last year against the re-election of President Alexander Lukashenko. Now, Protasevich, who no longer works with Nexta, was able to do his journalism in relative safety from Lithuania, where he's been in exile since last year. Late last year, in November, he was charged in absentia with organizing riots and inciting social hatred. Last Sunday, Protasevich was on a Ryanair flight heading back to Lithuania from a conference in Greece. Now, the plane was over Belarusian airspace when the crew received orders to land in Minsk because of a possibility of explosives on board. As soon as the flight landed, Protasevich and his girlfriend were arrested by Belarusian authorities. Unsurprisingly, no bombs were found on the flight, and the state-owned Belarusian news agency has reported that Lukashenko himself issued the order for the flight to land in Minsk. So Protasevich is behind bars. Where has the story gone since then? Well, the Belarusian government has released a video of Protasevich, but it bears all the hallmarks of a forced confession. Также сейчас я продолжаю сотрудничать со следствием и даю признательные показания по факту организации массовых беспорядков в городе Минск. Protasevich says he's being treated lawfully, but the bruises on his face tell a different story. Meanwhile, Western governments are professing outrage. Some have imposed sanctions. They say more are coming. But there is an element of hypocrisy in the reaction to this story, is there not? How quickly they forget. We've reported on the case of Edward Snowden, the former U.S. intelligence employee who leaked classified documents to journalists back in 2013. At that time, a plane carrying the former Bolivian president, Evo Morales, was forced to land in Austria because the Obama administration mistakenly thought Edward Snowden was on board. The United States received a lot of criticism for that, but nothing like what Belarus is facing right now. Okay, thanks, Mina. Hungary, Poland, and Serbia. What do they have in common? They're all ex-Soviet bloc countries that since shedding their communist ideologies have turned into illiberal democracies with some authoritarian habits, such as controlling their news media. You can now add another country to that list, Slovenia. The ex-Yugoslav state of just two million people has, in the past year, suffered a drastic decline in press freedom. That coincided with the re-election of Prime Minister Yanis Jancic a one-time anti-communist campaigner turned right-winger who's now into his third stint as prime minister. His first week back in office in March of 2020, 
was the same week that Slovenia confirmed its first case of COVID-19. And the pandemic has turned out to be a handy little pretext for the Prime Minister to clamp down on the press. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips now on Yanis Jansha and his self-proclaimed war with the media. I have a lot of experience with serious threats and I've been placed under police protection many times. But the threats I received last March were nothing like anything I'd experienced before. March 2020. Slovenia, like the rest of Europe, is going into lockdown. And, like journalists across the continent, Blaž Gaga is scrutinizing his government's response to the pandemic. He publishes an investigation into something called Crisis HQ, a secretive, seemingly unconstitutional government body set up by the Slovenian Prime Minister to coordinate the country's coronavirus strategy. On the very same evening that I published my investigation, Prime Minister Janis Janša accused me of being a liar on Twitter. After that, pro Jansha media outlets like Nova 24 TV started publishing news about me on a daily basis. I began receiving a lot of threats saying that I should be beaten up, shot, killed. Someone even broke into my house. Like any journalist, I can handle criticism, but it's different when it's the Prime Minister. Jansha himself is the chief agitator in this war with the media. Saying that the Prime Minister of Slovenia is at, quote, war with the media might sound like hyperbole, but those are the words of the Prime Minister himself. Just weeks after assuming office, faced with the COVID crisis, Janis Jansha published an open letter, not on how to deal with the pandemic, but rather how to deal with the press. His suggestion, use Twitter as an antidote to the country's media monopolies. I must say that I was not surprised in a way by this letter. Of course, one can always hope that someone will come to the census and focus on the health crisis. But unfortunately, as soon as he became prime minister, his Twitter feed showed that there is no such thing as calming down or taking time off attacking journalists. And in a way, the letter about the war with the media was a continuation of that approach. It basically said, you can envision yourself as a frog being slowly cooked. And he even used that metaphor. And, you know, if, if there was one thing sincere in that letter, it was that, because we are kind of the frogs waiting for the water to boil. This war has been going on for at least 15 years. Right now we're in, in you know, version three and it looks like there's no holds barred. Version 3. That refers to the fact that this is Jansha's third time as Prime Minister. And versions 1 and 2, or the way they ended, help explain his contempt for the Slovenian press. His first government was voted out in 2008, after reporters uncovered his role in a shady arms deal. His second term came to an end in 2013, during a media firestorm over the underreporting of his taxable assets. So Jansha has crafted his Slovenian Democratic Party's politics, the SDS, in opposition to the mainstream media. Among his most frequent targets, Slovenia's national press agency, the STA, and its national broadcaster, RTV. It's a formula tried and tested in other ex-Soviet bloc countries still finding their way in the European Union. Janis Jansha is to Slovenia what Viktor Orban is to Hungary or Jarosław Kaczynski is to Poland. All three are from the political right, were first elected national leaders in the late 1990s or mid-2000s, then were voted out of office, learning lessons along the way. All three then returned to power with a plan, bring the domestic media to heel. What sets Jansha apart from Kaczynski and Orban, however, is that he knows this kind of story from both sides. He's a former journalist. As a young journalist, Jansha exposed secrets of the Yugoslav army for which he was sentenced to prison. 
At the time, he was held up as a symbol of Slovenia's transition to democracy. But practically overnight, he became the defense minister and started going after journalists investigating the weapons trade. When he returned as prime minister in 2004, he managed to take control of the public media. He appointed a car salesman as CEO of RTV and put a government PR consultant as CEO of the STA. He got his way back then, and this is what he wants to do again. Except this time, instead of just controlling the STA, he wants to shut it down. In February, Jansha suspended all state funding, and the STA leadership is now concerned that, by July, the National Press Agency will be bankrupt. All of this, the open letter, the tweets, the attacks on media organizations and journalists, set off alarm bells in the European Union. It called on Jansha to attend a hearing in March this year. It didn't go well. Sophie Intvelt, who monitors media freedom at the European Parliament, put together a live Zoom hearing that Jansha agreed to attend. However, during the hearing, he demanded to play a 16-minute long propaganda video about how he sees the media in Slovenia. So I would now like to ask this video to be played. When they rightly denied his request, he cried censorship. It seems that you don't want to play this video because of its content. He simply disconnected and left the meeting. I've been told that the Prime Minister has disconnected. Uh, so I take it that the session was not to his liking. As all journalists know, if the chairwoman of the European Parliamentary Committee doesn't want to screen something, that's reason enough to air it. Verbal and physical attacks on journalists took place in Slovenia by and large during the left-leaning governments. All the media outlets were talking about the video, but none of them actually aired it. We aired it, and we got high ratings. That's Boris Tomasic, TV host and chief editor at Nova24 TV, one of a number of new right-wing Slovenian media outlets. They're part funded by Jancha's SDS party and have played a key role in amplifying its political agenda and Jancha's online targeting of the media. No one from the government was made available to discuss Jancha's attacks on the press, but Tomasic was willing to speak on behalf of not just his network, but his Prime Minister, too. Isn't Janis Jansha allowed to express his view on the Slovenian media landscape? Doesn't Janis Jansha have the right to state that the media is waging war on him and not the other way around? He's defending himself. There's a media monopoly in Slovenia, which is gradually being demolished. It started being torn down when Nova 24 TV was launched. And now it's being torn down by the government as well. I have to say that uh, among the media content and statements that we have been fact-checking in the past two years, Nova 24 TV is one of the main sources of misinformation and disinformation in Slovenia. The obvious public campaign against journalists and against media, this is relentless. We can only hope that the aggressive behavior or rather the aggressive rhetoric of this government will not be reflected in actual physical violence. We know that in a number of European countries that there were killings and assassination of journalists in countries such as Slovakia, Malta and uh, Greece recently. I know that there is a number of journalists and editors who are actually afraid that something could happen. The Prime Minister, however, seems unapologetic, unashamed. And that's amid calls for his impeachment, in Parliament and on the streets. As Slovenia prepares to celebrate 30 years of its independence, Janis Jansha is fighting battles at home and abroad. His war, however, is with the media. And finally, life was so much easier for racists before mobile phones came along and the videos they captured started to go viral. We've seen people get canceled, lose their jobs, their places in school, despite protestations that those telltale moments aren't who they really are. 
So here's an idea that's long overdue, an online excuse generator that tells everyone out there that you're not really a racist. It is the brainchild of a British internet comedian, Munya Chihuahua, here's hoping that you won't be needing his creation anytime soon. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Have you had a racist outburst that wasn't your fault? <laughs> we get it. Sometimes things don't go to plan. But at INR Insurers, we're here to show how not racist you really are. Instead of leaning on the classic catalogue of Caucasian excuses, you'll have access to our online I'm not a racist excuse generator. For example, I'm not racist, my first phone was a Blackberry. Or, I'm not racist, I once dipped my chips in reggae reggae sauce. Or, I'm not racist, my nan has a mole the shape of Barack Obama. Sign up today and we'll even throw in your very own black friend to have your back the next time an accidental n-word slips out. Take your Bane buddy out to a cafe, the park, or even for a swim at the beach. Actually, maybe not that last one. <laughs> With over a million clients, we know you'll love our service. So if you have any niggling doubts, give us a call today on 0800 I'm not a racist 456 because at INR Insurance, our job is to assist the racist.